Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital oh, I can say my own title. Chief Digital Manager for Data Diversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today Donna will be talking about data governance and data architecture, alignment and synergies. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen to activate that feature. And for questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And if you'd like to continue the networking and conversation after the webinar and learn more about Donna, just go to community.diversity.net. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers. Our speaker for today, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the managing director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Thank you. Always a pleasure to join you folks. Um, and, um, and thank you for a lot of you who on the call who often come to these as a monthly event. And if this is your first time uh, with Dataversity or this series, uh, it is a series, um, and all of the common question is, is this going to be recorded? Can I catch it again <laughs> or send it to my friends? Um, but it, it, yes, everything is recorded and is, is stored in perpetuity on Dataversity. So if you missed any of the previous ones that you see there on the list on and Master Data Management was last month, uh, you can catch them, um, and this one will be on demand as well. Uh, we hope you can also join us uh, upcoming. You'll see there's one each month, and hopefully some of those topics are of interest to you. Um, so today's topic is data governance, um, and data governance is is complicated. It can be very valuable, um, but partly is why it can be complicated is that it's very nuanced, um, and it consists of a lot of things. And, and often I, um, you know, full disclosure, I'm a consultant in my day job, um, and often what can be some of the complexity uh, in doing data governance is a misunderstanding of what people are talking about. Well, some people, they're talking about data governance at a very technical level in terms of data architecture and naming standards and business rules. Other people are talking more about committees um, and data stewardship roles, and they're all right. right? <laughs> That's what's complicated in, in the world, right, the and condition, right? There's not, a, nothing is only one thing. Uh, so we'll talk about both aspects of that because I think when data governance sings and, and does well, um, both of those can work in harmony. So that is the topic of today. Um, <clears throat> if you've joined uh, these sessions in the past, you'll be familiar with our framework. This is what we use in global data strategy in our practice. And I think it sort of touches on um, the holistic nature of all of this. Um, so what we spend a lot of our time doing, um, by our name you may guess it, is a lot of strategy, right? And even when someone comes in brand new and says, I want to do a strategy, yes, obviously we need to start at the business layer and see, you know, sort of the why. Well, why are we doing, why are we here? Um, but then pretty uh, quickly after that, it ties into the what. Um, so what sort of data is being stored? And you have to look at every piece of this, and a key part of this always is data architecture. And then the, I like to call it almost the glue, that the reason why it's across all of these is it really is that layer between the business and tech. So you'll see that it's the people, process, policy, and very importantly, we'll talk more about that, the culture. Um, I've been doing this for oh, a long time, probably over 25 years now, not specifically governance, but data management. Um, and the hardest thing, and I think the most nuanced thing of now when I go into a company, is to really look at that culture. That's often what can make or break data governance. Uh, you don't want to get that wrong. You know, a, a military organization is different than a startup, is different than a nonprofit, is different than a hospital. And the culture of those can be very different, and you need to look at that carefully. So we'll talk more about that. Um, and then, you know, if you're in data management, uh, you're familiar with a lot of these. These are still all tied together because you can't look at uh, data governance or data, data without data quality, right? We can't be looking at that without master data. So these are all tied together. Security, obviously, is a big part. Um, but we'll specifically be talking about data governance and the architecture component of that. 
Um, so since we're data folks, we like facts and figures. <laughs> this is uh, some figures from a survey we do yearly now. Um, this was last year's survey on trends in data management. For those of you who just a note who might have done the survey for this year's, uh, it, is, it is in progress. Uh, so hopefully by um, later this summer or early autumn, you'll, you'll see the results of the 2020 version. Um, but this is last year's, which is still fairly current. And I thought this was great news and probably not so surprising. Everybody and their sister now is thinking of being a data-driven business or data-driven organization. It isn't always just a for-profit company. It could be nonprofits, it could be universities, right? Um, over 76% have data governance in place, which I think is great. And over 50%, now just be careful how we read this, it's not over 50% who have a data architecture, which I'm sure is also true. This is 50% that specifically said they're able to collaborate better because of their defined data architecture, which I thought was a great finding, not surprising to me. Um, I do a lot of that. I think a conceptual data model, for example, is an excellent way. I, I worked with two clients just this morning <laughs> on a conceptual data model in two very different industries where they were using that as really the, the roadmap for their entire data-driven initiative. It's a nice way to communicate. That's not the only ar architecture artifact. We'll talk about a bunch more. But that's not a surprise to me, and hopefully, if it is a surprise to you, by the end of this uh, session, you'll sort of understand more of how you can use architecture to really be a communication tool as much as a governance tool. Because I see those as linked very closely together, which leads me to, oops, um, sorry, uh, to my next, Shannon can't say your own name, I can't move my own slides, uh, to the next slide, <laughs> which really is that, that balance, right? So if you look at what do we even mean by data governance. Um, I took this from the Data Management Body of Knowledge, um, which is a great resource if you're not familiar with it. Um, and the DMBOC, as we would like to call it, talks about governance as that exercise of authority, control, and shared decision making, which I see is almost the opposite, right? You have authority, which is sort of, you may be wondering why there's a yin and yang <laughs> at the bottom, my hippie side comes out. Um, so if you think of the yin and yang, which is sort of the Eastern philosophy of, of that, the two sides to every coin, which might be a, if, if, hopefully I don't mangle this definition for folks, right? But on one side, you do need to be very strong and precise. Um, and, and the other side, you might want to be a little more flexible and yielding. So that's very similar to data governance, right? I think a lot of us, when we're thinking of data governance, we think of the stick, that authority and that control. But just as much, or perhaps, especially as I get older and, and more experienced and learn a little bit about the world, often it's that carrot that really gets things going, or that shared decision making. But you just can't tell people what to do. I think a lot of us in data management who are very sort of fact and, and figures oriented, and well, we all are, it would be a lot easier if we could just have people follow the rules. But people are people, um, and often those rules uh, may not be the right ones if you really don't get the holistic view in that shared decision making. Um, and we'll talk a lot about that throughout this session. It's almost the theme of the whole session, if you have to get that balance right. That's the whole point of yin and yang, is that it's a balance. We all have both sides of those in us, and when you are in harmony, um, you have both of those right. And I think that really applies to data governance as well. You really need to balance both of those. Um, so if we look, again, we're data management folks, we love definitions. Uh, data architecture, what do we mean by that? So again, reference the data DMBOC. Um, and I, I like their definition as well, and we'll talk about this, um, is representing the organizational data at different levels of abstraction so they can be understood. And that, to me, is key to the communication. And don't get that one wrong, <laughs> right? So if you're talking to a business person, a conceptual data model, a business process model, great ways to communicate. Physical data model, probably not so much, right? You're talking to a database administrator, yes, very much a, a physical data model or DDL or data definition. Um, so just make sure you get that right. And I've seen, again, hopefully, I mean, what a lot of folks have shared with me, and I, I always appreciate that. After the webinars, people will sort of say what was helpful. And a lot of people say what's helpful about these is, is kind of that real world experience. And I think I'll try to share those throughout. Um, often when I do see these maybe go in a, a wrong direction, it's maybe picking the wrong tool for the right job <laughs> of, you know, are we, are we picking a too technical tool? Or on the other sense, I've seen people buy a, a very business friendly tool that looks great and demos well, but isn't technical enough to really do the governance you need. So, so think of that. What level of abstraction are you going for? Um, 
because these artifacts are critical to governance. They're describing the existing state, talking about the future state, getting your requirements, the integration, all of those things at the bottom that really define that data strategy that I mentioned in that um, framework above. So all of those things are think to, things to consider. Definitions are, are, can be dry and boring. Um, I'm going to share the, this, this theme might be dated, but I know for a while around the internet there was this sort of meme that went around of you know, what my friends think I do, what my mom thinks I do. And I think that applies to governance, right? And we have to be careful about this. So what my friends think I do when I say I do data management and data governance, probably not the life of the party. You know, Don is that nerdy person that sits on a computer a lot. Well, they're kind of not wrong, right? But probably not the most flattering definition of what I do because I think what I do is cool. What my mom and my parents think I do, they do know the word metadata. They were very impressed that they could, they, they remember the word metadata, but I think they think I'm some sort of librarian type of information management, kind of like library stuff, right? What society thinks I do, you're one of those data scientists, right? You're those mad data scientists that, again, sit on your laptop a lot and look kind of nerdy. Well, not quite wrong, but I'm not a data scientist. Um, what my coworkers think I do, now be careful on this one. Um, are you the one that just yells at them about stuff? And you're going to come in, data governance can have an image problem. I think I actually had a presentation on that. It, just the word governance, you know, we'll, we'll say at the you know, Harvard Business Review article that data science was the sexiest job of the 21st century. They kind of didn't say data governance, right? <laughs> governance just by definition seems to be what you're telling people what to do. So be careful of that. People are already going to have that perception. So think of that shared decision-making slide, the yin and yang. Don't be, you know, too yang and just yelling at people. Um, it's just too easy to do. <laughs> My favorite one is what I think I do. I'm the governator. I'm saving the world from mismanaged data. I actually sort of um, stole this from uh, just a sound check, Shannon. You can hear, right? We can. Shannon? Somebody. Yeah, it took me okay, a minute so to unmute myself. But yeah, here, okay. you're fine. I wanted to double check someone on the chat so they couldn't. Um, thank you, folks. Um, so this governor actually stole from a client. It was one of our clients outside of London, and she was actually looking for a head of data governance. And she says, I want to put it as the governator, because that, that's a sexy title. And we said, you know, I don't think you're going to get past that by management, but that was your internal view of the role of the head of data governance. Because um, you sort of are the governator, right? I mean, you are saving the world from mismanaged data. You often feel like that, um, and you really have to work across the organization to really save the world without people knowing, right? The, uh, you're the Clark Kent, really, <laughs> during the day, but at night, um, you know, you're the governor. But really, what you actually do in all full seriousness, um, what maybe people forget, is that data governance is really driving the success of the business. And I think more and more people are getting that. So I love what I do. I, I think it's really fun because I get to work with so many different companies. And what I find interesting is I would say, count my head, but five of our new data governance projects this year were either driven by AI, machine learning, business, you know, the, uh, the new emerging tech, wanting to be more data driven. Um, and we have two startup companies that basically at the very beginning of their startup, um, tech startups wanted to get governance right, which I think is awesome. Because I think so many people think of governance as being on the left, you know, data management is kind of the old school, you know, boring stuff. And I'm not seeing that anymore. Uh, it's not that I have rose colored glasses, I'm actually, you know, seeing people getting that you can't do governance without, uh, you can't have a successful business without governance. Sort of like I always think of governance a lot like finance. You know, most people, uh, even a startup, realize you really can't be successful without a finance and financial governance. Data is the same thing. So, anyway, kind of a facetious slide, but hopefully got you thinking, got, got the point across a little bit. Um, another way um, to look at data governance, and I've, I've used this with some of my clients as well, is kind of the so what, and there's sort of two aspects of that. You're either going to reduce risk um, or increase opportunities, maybe the more simple way of looking at it. Um, often that's kind of called the defense or offense model. So, and again, um, maybe, uh, partly because, you know, the history of data governance or of data management, too many of us often come in on that too much on the reducing risk. Well, you're going to go to jail if you don't do governance. Well, are they really going to go to jail? And if they are, maybe that's not the thing you want to lead with. <laughs> um, or is it more like I was saying, so many of our customers now are doing governance because of the offense. Data is strategic. Of course, I want to manage it. I want to be a data-driven organization. I want to be data-centric. Of 
course I need good quality data. So there's both. And, and most every company has two aspects of that. Yes, there's GDPR. Yes, there's PCI. Um, and you want to make sure you get that balance right, and I'll talk more about that as well. You don't want to go into a healthcare company that's really trying to protect patient data and say, gosh, there's so much opportunity. We can make so much money off these patients, which may be true. It's just a little tone deaf. Um, and at the same time, you don't want to go to a startup that's all talking about making all this money and saying, well, guys, you might go to jail if you don't get your PCI. And, and that's true, too, but probably not what that audience wants to hear, right? So just kind of think of that um, as you go through. The other one that I think is not stressed enough, um, and I, again, I, I'm confident I think people are starting to get that, is the one on the lower left, the improving efficiency. Um, you know, what your parents always said, if you don't have time to do it right, do you have time to do it again? That kind of famous thing. You know, a lot of folks think, um, oh gosh, why don't we just skip that complicated data management stuff and the data governance stuff, and let's just do quick wins and, and fail fast. And again, you will fail fast. <laughs> I can guarantee that if you don't have any governance. Because really, when things are organized and done well, things just move more quickly. So, you know, there's a lot of famous um, statistics out there of, of that sexiest data scientist that's hired with a very high salary to do all this great analysis, and they spend 80% of their time or more cleaning up the data, right, because the data isn't good. In fact, one of the clients just this morning, we were on a data governance call using a data model, <laughs> and their biggest driver was that very expensive data scientist hired to do data analysis, and they basically said, you've got good data, but you don't have good data quality. You have a lot of interesting stuff. You need to get data governance in place, and that launched the entire initiative. So good to think of. Doing it right is more efficient. Um, and then that collaboration and accountability, and I put those together, again, that yin and yang. So yes, you can tell people what to do. Yes, people have a responsibility, but maybe I'm naive, but I'm usually not proven wrong on this one, that I, I think most people in companies are adults, and, and very few people come to work and say, I want to you know, mess up the company's data. If that's the case, get rid of them. There's just no question there. Um, but it's usually because people don't see the big picture, or I didn't realize, or I'm using this data in this way, didn't know the downstream effect. So that's why getting in a more collaborative way um, and having these committees that are cross-functional, a lot of folks don't like the word committee, but gosh, they are so much more efficient with some of this. Just look at all of the impact before you build and get sales and marketing and development in the same room and understand before you build. Um, it can go a long way. So hopefully that's kind of a helpful framework to sort of thinking of that. Um, and as I hopefully have pointed out already, it really is both the stick and the carrot. And give that some thought. So a lot of it we think of governance as avoiding risk. That's true. But governance can also be an opportunity driver. You know, think of that as getting that collaboration together and getting your data right so that you can you can really be more effective. Again, hopefully in these webinars I can give you some kind of that real world experience and, and gotchas that I've been gotcha with <laughs> or someone who looked like me. I mean, I've never made a mistake, but other people with a similar name to me um, might have. Um, so this one, what style of governance fits your organization? I think the hardest part of data governance, and I have been super techie. I've written data governance tools and I've written the code myself. I know how hard it is. But even with how hard data lineage and all of that is, the people side, at least for me, <laughs> I think for everybody, is hard. Getting that culture right is probably the biggest nut to crack. So think of that. What is the style for your organization that you're working with or are in? Is it more that offense, the people want to hear about profitability, revenue, customer satisfaction, competitive advantage, that is what's driving governance? Or is it more about we want to be compliant, we want to avoid audits and fines, we've had a fraud, we've been audited, we want to be secure? And it's probably not all or either one. Um, so, but just think of that in terms of a spectrum and maybe give some pondering time right now. Are you a, a full-on red? You're a startup and they don't want to hear anything negative about compliance. They just, you have to sneak it in. Or is it completely defensive and we're just trying to not be sued? We're just trying to protect our patients, whatever that is. Um, or more likely it's somewhere in that purple spectrum. But just give that some thought. Um, and that's where you can go either really well with your, especially if you're trying to present up to management. Think of what they're worried about. Did they just get audited and you're going to go talk about, you know, increasing revenue and profitability? Yeah, of course, everyone cares about that, but they're probably worried about the audit. Or, you know, are, are they talking about their great new marketing launch and you're talking about being audited and you seem like a buzzkill? Uh, just give that one some thought um, and get that one right. 
On, on a similar note, uh, I would say the same thing with architecture. And you may have seen these slides before. I, I like this one. It's, it's a good uh, level set of where you are in your organization, because neither one of these is right. Just like totally offense or totally defense is not right. Are you so academic that, and I've seen both of these, all of the above, um, that you spend so much time getting every data model right and full data lineage right that it takes two years to even launch a product? I, I would have seen I see less and less of that now, although I have two clients we're working with now that really wanted to inventory every single data element in the entire organization before even starting governance. And, and I tried to convince them not to do that, because I think that is too academic and you're not going to be agile enough to keep up with the business. That's just too much um, to, you know. And so that's on one side. Are we so academic that we, we are, seem like the thinker and we're so set in stone that we never get anywhere? Or is it, ah, oh, let's skip that whole architecture stuff. We're too busy for that. Let's just get stuff done. We're going to move fast. And as you may know or have experienced, that's almost even worse because uh, nothing gets done either because it's just chaos and you keep redoing the same thing. So the right balance between that, there is no one perfect answer, and there may be a spectrum depending on the project or the, the stage you are in your organization. The right answer is that business value. What is going to give the most business value? Are you developing a heart monitor that's going to save the life of a patient and there's a data IoT version of that? Yes, please be a little more on the academic side because, you know, if that's my heart. <laughs> I'd like you to get that right, right? Or are you doing just a startup proof of concept that's going to be thrown away, and you're, you know, maybe you don't need everything as academic, right? Um, so just give that some thought. And there's no right answer. It's really dependent on that business value. But give that both of those some thought. Are you a wild west type company and you don't want to be too academic, or are you too academic and maybe need to loosen up a little bit? So you may have seen that there's kind of two aspects of that. There's the technical side. There's the business side which can be good or bad. So the good part of that is there's something, um, something in it for everybody with data governance. Some people, again, think of data governance as the committees and the stewardship and the, the collaboration with the business and, and selling up to management and down to folks in operations. Absolutely a great part of governance, kind of the touchy-feely side. Perfect place for you. Some folks really get very excited about uh, getting data lineage right and setting data standards and doing data inventory and creating data models and creating the database, the techie nerdy side. Great. There's a place for you. Um, if you're a smaller organization, you have to do it all and you're one of those unicorns that can do all of those well. Um, and if you are, that's great um, because I think the perfect data governance person can sort of do both of those or at least understand enough of both of those um, to really make that thing. Um, but that's also where there's some confusion sometimes when one person is talking about the committee and one person is talking about data lineage. And they kind of have two sides of what data governance is. We often use this framework um, for data governance. We've, we've touched on some of that. And really, you need to look holistically around governance to make that work. So we've talked a little bit already about the aligning everything with a business goal or objective, doing data governance just because it's a good idea. Mm, it's not the best, you know, there's a lot of things we could do because they're a good idea and there's limited time and budget. So focus on something that's going to be of value to the business and really focus on their issues, challenges, or again, opportunities if they're more of a, you know, uh, the carrot type of organization. And then look holistically across all of it. What is the vision for governance? And I, we spend a lot of time on this um, when we do projects even create a marketing plan for your data governance. What's the vision? What's the strategy? Why Why do people want to do this, which ties into your business goals? And then how do you set up the organization and people? We'll talk about that. Do you have data stewards, data owners, data custodians? Do you call them none of that? Um, do you have committees? Do you, how, do you, how you do that is a big part. Um, what are the processes and workflows? And that's kind of a meta level there. There's the data governance processes and workflows. How do you log an issue? How do you correct deficiencies? How do you publish standards? Those are processes and workflows that are important. But there's also the business process and workflows. You know, how does the business manage and touch data? Because that's often where the problems go wrong. I'm entering data as part of a sales cycle, or I'm onboarding a I don't know, provider onto my hospital. Did I check the credentials? You know, all of that type of thing. That's true governance often, because that's really right at the coalface. Um, and then, you can't manage what you can't measure. So what are the KPIs and measures you have in place? 
Are we looking at quality? Are we looking at completeness? Are we looking for lineage? Which of those are the most important? Because again, you can't manage everything. So, you know, how are we going to manage it? And then, if I haven't beat this over the head enough, this idea of the culture and communication. How do you communicate this vision and strategy? I mean, it's almost like I did a stint in marketing for a while, and the techie side of me cringed at that, and the rest of my body decided that was the one of the best experiences I had because everything is marketing. So I almost see this as a launch plan, right? What, what are the objectives? What's our vision and strategy? What's going to get people bought in? How do you organize it? And then how do you continually communicate and communicate and then tell people again why this is great and highlight your successes along the way? Um, so uh, the tools and technology, I, I don't want to mislead that it's most important because it's at the bottom. I mean, it is a foundation, but I, I see too many people start with the tools. Um, but yes, you need tools, plural, probably. There is no one data governance tool. I'll get into that. Um, uh, and really the data to manage all that. So, but this needs to be holistically across the board. Um, another kind of matrix we put together, and don't worry, I won't read every cell here, but hopefully if you, you know, these slides are available after the webinar, um, just to kind of give you, if you, for each one of those buckets, you know, what, what do we mean by vision and strategy? What do we mean by organization and people? So yes, it's your organization structures, but also give some thought about who's the key stakeholders, who's producing the data, who's modifying it. You know, just kind of some ways to look across all of these questions to make sure you've kind of covered all the bases. Because um, that's often one of the risks of governance. You don't want to boil the ocean and do everything, but often you didn't talk to the right group and there was a key area or a key business process that was left out. So looking holistically without going too far into the weeds is kind of that, again, that yin and yang balance to get right. So when we talk about the people in the process of the organization, again, uh, referring to that trends and data management report, uh, I thought this was interesting. So this was data management, not specifically data governance, but they are related, um, and, and data governance did come out strongly in this. So when we asked who is driving data management in an organization, it was multiple choice, um, but you'll see it was a fairly wide range. So a few things were, I, I thought, heartening, a few C-level titles. The CEO is driving data management. And again, this was multiple choice. I don't think the CEO is setting data standards in the database. I'd be really surprised at that one. But the fact that they're championing it um, and supporting it, awesome. That's a great thing to see that that many CEOs are really part of this. But then you'll see across the board business stakeholders. Again, I don't think they would be creating the data lineage, but they are completely bought in the value and should be data stewards and data owners, um, as well as some that probably aren't supplies, data architect. I would hope it would be part of data management, right? But the the breadth of that and the number of roles I think is spot on because I think to get data governance right, you need all of that. And then the top one other that you see that was pretty high there, right in vote that we probably should have listed to be <laughs> clear on that one, um, was the data governance lead. Um, and I would say that's true because data governance lead is that sort of, again, that unicorn person that can motivate and champion and really drive this initiative. For those of you who are data governance lead, I often see that a data governance lead can be a nice pathway up to chief data officer because you're really understanding all of the aspects of the business. You're coordinating, you're championing, and you're doing, and you're really you know, helping data be part of a data-driven business. So I thought that was sort of interesting. When we get, so that's a data governance lead, but you'll see there's a lot of other roles, particularly sort of business stakeholders that typically in data governance land we call everyone has their favorite term, but a common one are kind of your data owners or data stewards or data stewardship is probably the more generic term that encompasses all of those. That is important. And I think especially when people are starting, that can seem daunting. Seriously, we're going to, all these business people are really going to want to talk about business definitions and, and do this with us, <laughs> us being the IT people. Um, and generally when we come in as consultants and maybe do a strategy or do a data governance initiative, we start with a lot of interviews, which might be weird uh, formally if, if you work for the company, but doesn't mean you can't do that informally. Talk to a lot of different people across the organization. And what I, I would almost guarantee, I'm not a betting gal, but I would bet on this one, you will find people who are passionate about this stuff, and we call them the hidden heroes, who maybe had never been asked about their data quality. And probably I have seen across the board, I've seen people build their own data models, people who have done their own data quality remediation and profiling, and are often very pleased to finally be given a voice to actually have some responsibility, yes, um, but be part of the story. So I would n don't be surprised that there are people on your side 
that get this, and often it's the business that get governance much more than IT because they're feeling the pain point every day. Um, they're seeing what bad data can do, so don't be surprised. That said, uh, be careful there. So it isn't just, uh, it's great that you have a bunch of people that are excited about this, but you do want to have some sort of structure around that. Again, where sometimes I see data governance having a hiccup or a misstep is, oh, great, I know Mary, John, and Michael, and we've been talking about this forever. We're, we're going to be the committee, and we're just going to start, because we've been doing this stuff. Give it some thought. How are you organizing it? By business area, by subject area? Do you have the right levels? Is there a direct level, manager level? You have a mix of tech and IT, and, and don't do it based on Joe likes this stuff, and so do I, so we're going to lead it. Really look more um, you know, or in an organized way. Here's one way, and again, I, this is not prescriptive at all. Every government organization is different. Yes, there are excellent um, tools out there. The data management body of knowledge is probably the best first place to start. It really goes through the basics of what a governance committee is, what a, you know, a data owner is, et cetera. But then just use that as a guide. It is not a how-to manual, it's a guide, right? And so the, the most important thing is to customize this to match your organization and your uh, culture. But here is a sort of common one uh, that you know, we tend to see generally, and I would say everywhere, there is, is and should be an executive sponsor. Um, and executive sponsors, you know, the whole, I would assume the whole executive council um, would be bought in. But there's one person that really is the champion for this. When the rubber hits the road, and this will always happen, everyone's bought into governance until they need to change. <laughs> We're all human beings. Oh, that's someone else who's going to do the data quality. You mean I have to change my business process? Yes. And that's often the executive sponsor that can help A, champion it, say, hey, guys, we're doing stuff differently. This is awesome. You want to be a part of it. And also when those hard decisions are made, they're going to back you up. Guys, yes, we do. We can't just do it the old way. It didn't work before. It's not going to work now. And then in terms of the business side, you have the business data owner. Uh, that I would say that the difference between that and a business data steward, and again, names, names, everyone has a different, but kind of a common way to look at this, is the owner might be more of the strategic or the manager or director level that sets the direction, understands the high-level business rules, and then the steward is someone more at the operational level that really probably understands the pain points day to day, the maybe more subject matter expert uh, that's entering the data, using the data, et cetera. Um, and both are super important, but you don't want to get them someone too high level and asking them, again, we've seen this all go wrong, I've had seen VP level people being asked to do kind of master data match rule remediation all day long, and funny they never wanted to do that again. Or you have people too low level being asked strategic questions, and both of those are wrong. You want to get the right role for the right responsibility. And then a technical data steward, separate those. A system is not the same as a business area, and often that's an easy kind of mistake to make. And maybe you do that as a first step. Oh, that's our. CRM data. Well, the CRM is a system. Are you talking about your customer data? That's different. Um, and, and so often an organization, or it'll be something, oh yeah, the X29 system, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, we know that's our product database. Well, that's not your product. That's a system. And systems change, data remain, right? You'll have products, hopefully the whole, whole uh, history of your company, if you're a product company. Um, but your systems will change. So getting separating your data from the system is super important. That said, someone who understands those systems is pretty critical because that's where the data often lives. Um, so data governance lead, again, some asterisks. In a perfect world, that's a full-time role. If you really want to make this critical, that person would be able to spend a full time really championing, understanding, setting up, running the meetings, all of that. Isn't always feasible. That would be ideal. Data architects, similarly, or plural, uh, but generally they would be a lead data architect that's almost the um, corresponding party on the technical. If you think of data governance, it's probably more of a business type role or someone who understands technology, but it's more in the business uh, side. Data architect is probably that the opposite, who's more technical but can speak business, and they can take those um, requirements and create data models and things like that. Um, and then data security, obviously, is very important. It's a different thing than governance. Often it's kind of com confused uh, between them, uh, but should, should be part of this group as well because those rules and regulations are, are key. Uh, a couple of comments coming through. ELT is often an acronym for executive leadership team. Every company seems to have their own acronym, but that's kind of a common one. We love our acronyms. <laughs> but probably, you're right, with governance, we should have had a glossary and define that. So my bad. Um, 
So that's one way, again, please don't just take this and say, yep, that's how we're going to do it, because that may not fit you. That may not fit your organization, but just kind of some thoughts. What's so important, if you go away with one thing, this is a good one to remember, is when you create your governance structure, map with your organizational capabilities and your organizational structure. Um, are you a top-down organization? Is it more federated and distributed? Um, is it rules-based? Do people hate rules? Do people like committees or not like committees? Oh, so much of that is what can make or break this, because you want to make people want to be part of the state of governance in a way that makes sense for them. So define the organizational capabilities. That's also going to help you define who your data owners are. Again, have someone from finance or um, someone from product development, not someone from a system. Um, and there's different ways to do ownership. That's just one. But um, think of that. And then how is your, your organization organized? So the one, a little, that's one example on the right of a data governance organizational structure, which is pretty top down. You have your executive, strategic, tactical, operational. A lot of them sort of turn out that way. Um, but absolutely, that is not the only way to do it. Um, and technical issue. Um, for example, this next slide is one that was interesting. This is an anonymized version of a, a governance structure we put together for, ironically, it was a manufacturing company, a big auto manufacturer. Um, and I would have thought uh, that that would have been a very top-down, when you think of manufacturing, I think very process-oriented, very kind of rules and regulation, we need to get things done. The culture there was very different, and we should have started with um, a structure that was more sort of top-down, like the one you see on the right. You have a committee, and, and then they make decisions. And even though, yes, we had committees, their culture, they just, they did not like boxes, <laughs> they didn't like hierarchy, and they really sort of said, no, we're more of a distributed, overlapping circles kind of people. <laughs> they wanted to see things flowing. Again, this was an engineering company, which really surprised me. Like, we're at a nonprofit that said that or something, or a, you know, counseling company. That would have made more sense. Um, but this was an engineering company, but they said we want pastel colors and we want overlapping circles and we do things as teams. Um, and also they, want, they were using Agile and they said we need to do things fast. So the idea was we would have these overlapping councils where it was more focused on data innovation and collaboration, but then we also built things quickly. So it doesn't mean collaboration slows things down. Again, I think it speeds things up. Um, so, but I thought this was another uh, helpful one. Another one that actually just came up this morning, so I'll share it with you. Um, I thought it was why often we show this idea of these work groups, right? So I've got my data governance committee, and then maybe we create work groups to solve a particular issue. And some, we often kind of show it this way. As a result of the steering committee, we have a work group. This particular client said, you know, that makes people feel like they're at the bottom. <laughs> and I hadn't really thought of that, how you visualize these things. So we, we sort of showed along the top, because really these working groups were making very strategic decisions and giving recommendations to everybody. Um, and they weren't at the bottom, and that's not what we were trying to show at all. Uh, but it kind of looked that way. So again, how you show this and does it fit with the culture is actually super critical. You want to get people psyched to come to these meetings. Um, and they are. So if you're skeptical, rethink of your model, because most of the time, once you get these right, they are. So for example, what you call it, um, you'll see here that this was called the Data Innovation Council, and they had data innovation teams. Was governance a big part of that? Yep. But they were also a very agile, very forward-thinking company, and they, they didn't want to make it seem like, um, you know, we're just sitting there telling you that person with the megaphone telling you what to do. We actually want, this is going to be driving the business and we want to innovate and move in an agile way. So just even what you name it, there was an insurance company we work with up in Canada and this was like such a dramatic version of that. We had a data governance council and we're really having trouble getting people to be excited. We called it the data innovation team and people were kind of fighting to be on it. <laughs> Again, that was literally just a naming, which we could have, because we actually were doing a lot of innovation, but it was just kind of how you look at it. So again, all of this is sort of meta. There is a organization structure for your governance, but there's also an organization structure of the organization that you need to align with for uh, your governance. So um, again, next month's webinar is on enterprise architecture, so I don't want to go too deep into these, but um, a lot of enterprise architecture tools are great for governance. So this is kind of a business capability model, which is an EA, enterprise architecture tool. What we often do is kind of uh, overlay data domains onto that. Where is customer data used across the organization? 
spell that one probably across a lot of places, marketing and sales and product development and human, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, kind of a nice, again, a lot of these high-level overlays. Um, I mentioned there's a lot of ways to do stewardship, and I'll fight you outside the, of the hallway. I often get in arguments, especially a lot of the conferences about this. Uh, almost the classic academic way to do data stewardship is, I've seen too many people say, well, I have a steward for customer and a steward for product and a steward for, you know, employee. I do not like that. Um, and so I'm, a, I'm the minority there, but I'm right. Because I'm me. No, I'm just kidding. I'm right, but here's the reason why I'm right. Um, who owns a customer? Nobody owns a customer, right? Maybe, yes, maybe in the data architecture, there's someone that should be managing the customer database or even the customer data model. But there's that whole customer life cycle and, germ and journey. And often what goes wrong is that there's one person who owns a customer. For someone who owns the marketing side of customer, it's not the same person who owns the sales side who owns the customer service side. Data is used differently, and there's different types of data. Um, maybe the, the easiest way to think of that is who owns patient, right? There's someone that when you go into the doctor and they ask for your address and your insurance and your medical history, it's not the same person talking about your diagnosis, which is your doctor. And it might be easy to say, oh, that person at the front desk owns all your customer data. I do not want the receptionist owning my diagnosis, right? <laughs> so give that some thought. Um, so anyway, um, align to your business organization. Another thing to think of, again, so much of what makes governance sing is that touchy-feely nuance. And getting that just enough data governance, and this is where it also starts to go into the technical side. So this is touchy-feely meets technical. Um, I've seen it go wrong in both ways. You, certain things in the organization must be highly governed, patient data, uh, customer data. That's probably your master data that, yes, it's highly shared, it's highly governed, um, and it should be very much locked down. Other things, like you have a sandbox for some data exploration on social media analysis, shouldn't be. You're going to slow people down too much by having it overly governed. Yes, you shouldn't put credit card information out on, on that, but other than that, with the right guardrails in place, let people be. Um, and it's a progression. So yes, core enterprise data, maybe that's your warehouse, should be governed, but probably not as closely as master data, which should be very carefully governed. Functional and operational data can mean a lot of things. It could be your operational systems, it could be a department data mark. Again, it should be governed, but maybe the departments themselves can govern it. Maybe it doesn't have to be enterprise-wide. Um, and, and it can be what we're also showing uh, evolution. So maybe things that started with exploratory, we, oh, we found a variable that's actually super important. Did you know that, I don't know, hobby is really important in an insurance company? We want to start tracking that actually as master data because it affects your rate. Okay, well now we're now that should be man, you know, up there in the master data level. So it's a, and if you have master data, I'm sure people doing data science will, will love to see it. Um, so it isn't an either or it's a progression, um, but you want to give careful thought to that one. Another thing to think about um, is getting that right balance. And I see this as sort of different. Maybe this is hard to read. Um, whether it's human or whether it's automated and technical, and whether it's sort of reactive or proactive, um, and whether you resolve it kind of at the source system or post-processing. So kind of a lot to put on one slide. Maybe it doesn't work. Um, but proactive on the business side would be, you know, if, if bad customer data is going in, maybe we should train the people putting the data in to do it right. <laughs> and let's look at the systems. Maybe we have the right policies and procedures. I'll, I'll give a case study at the end where, it was the sales team putting in the data, and they didn't know where the data went, so they didn't care. Once they found out that the data fed the leads they got to sell to customers, they were a lot more careful putting the data in. Probably the best data governance we could have done, get people to care and fix it at its source, right? Um, if you don't do that, then you need to do more reactive, uh, which maybe is a data quality cleanup. It's not an either or, right? But the more you do it up front, you don't have to have a data cleanup and keep cleaning up, cleaning up. And then somewhere in the middle, is your data stewardship, right? Because this is an evolution of, yes, it's data stewardship that looks at what we need to clean up and what we can do proactively. And then <laughs> this, is, this is also a valid thing. I saw one of the comments went through about critical data elements. Not everything is critical. Conscious disregard. Maybe some stuff doesn't need to be governed as carefully. So give that some thought. So on the technical side, so how are we going to change a business process? Well, let's actually change the business rules in that application. So I still see this. I still see that after so many years in the industry drop-down lists. Actually, my, the funniest one, I actually tweeted, it was a data quality webinar, and they asked for, um, 
in the U.S., your, your state, and there, there wasn't a drop-down. And, and so, like, male or female, there wasn't a drop-down, which, all right, for a data nerd, that's actually very funny because that's one of the easiest things to fix. If you, there's only two values in your form, have a drop-down, and that's going to help your data quality, right? Get the business rules up in the front. And that can be a very, you know, some of the data quality tools can do address validation at the source, et cetera, et cetera. Because if not, you're going to do it reactively and do your data cleansing and, and ETL into the warehouse. And then again, in that middle side, can you be auditing it with dashboards? Can you augment with external data sources? That's kind of that, that middle part of, of doing the data stewardship as you go. So now that we're kind of getting into more on the technical side, uh, the question I love to hate is, and the vendor, the good news is that they now data governance is hot and everybody wants to be on the, um, yes, it's more to, than two values to gender, but, or, or is sex two values and gender more than one? But um, the point is, have, have drop downs. So um, data governance is hot, and because it's hot, now every tool is a data governance tool, which is probably not too incorrect, but what I get frustrated with is um, we'll have a data governance project, people jump right to what tool can I buy to fix it? And that's the wrong question to ask, because tools should come secondary. All the other stuff we talked about really should be the primary. But that said, tools are important. It, a lot of this you cannot do without a great tool, and so give some thought to it. Um, one way to look at this is, you know, think of the functionality first. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to get a tool to help with the organizational structure, with the process and workflow, logging issues, glossary? That's kind of more on the business side. And or are we trying to get a tool to do more of the data lineage, uh, data quality, um, date, trusted data sets and that sort of thing, and then do a heat map. The other part of that is how technically important it is and what the business need is, and then on the bottom is who your key audience is. And I've seen very good tools go very wrong um, because people pick the wrong one. And I've seen a cu customer that wanted to do really data, uh, detailed data lineage for GDPR, and they wanted you know, your almost classic source to target um, mapping for your warehouse and where every field was and how it was populated. And they picked a tool that was very user friendly for more of the processes and glossary and things like that, but didn't have the guardrails. It wasn't on that spectrum of the technical side that they needed. So it was a great tool, but they were sort of lulled into the nice pretty front end and it didn't do what they needed on the back end. I've also seen folks that maybe go too far on the data lineage and mapping, but they don't need to go that detailed. And really, when you try to sell it to the business, they need something more simple like a glossary. And again, a perfect governance would have both. Um, uh, but just give that some thought in terms of the relative importance as you look at a tool. So um, a nice thing um, about these tools is they can really help, and you can do them in a nice targeted way. So here's an example of. Um, some of the data architecture tools that uh, can provide a, a roadmap. So you can do these in small targeted projects, and I'll give an example of that. You know, what data do we prioritize? Can I do a data model to really start to uh, align some of those crit business data uh, elements? Can I have process models to show where that data is used? What's the full data architecture, the system data architecture? What are the business rules? What's the policies around that? And do I have a data quality dashboard to really see the effectiveness of that? That seems like a lot, but if you, it doesn't have to be if you do it in small chunks, right? What if we're just looking at a small project about what, this is an insurance company, what, what data would need for our brokers? What do we need for customers? Try to pick a, a one question. You know, are we trying to do credit history? What, what small piece of this can we do to make these artifacts real to the business? What you don't want to do is start with an enterprise logical model that's going to take you two years that no one cares about. You could even do a conceptual model in little pieces or a logical model in pieces, or just do the business process that people care about. And do these in small chunks um, so you don't try to boil the ocean. Um, I'm a big fan of metadata, and the way I look at that is that metadata can really make data governance actionable. Um, so these tools are good, um, and you can sort of take these policies and then implement them in the database. So again, the more you can automate so that whatever the business rule is, you know, gender codes or state codes or whatever it is, those are your only choices, <laughs> make that easier. And then you can sort of audit that with a lot of these data uh, tools. Um, metadata management tools, we have and will and could do a whole session on this. Um, but, but think of the right uh, tool for the right job. 
So do you need, and all of these are good in the right, in the right sense, that enterprise catalog metadata repository that stores everything together with a common metadata. Could just a, maybe even your data modeling tool uh, repository be enough if you're really looking for glossary and, and, and some definitions of that may be already in your logical model? Or, and or, are you needing to share this externally with things like XML and an external re registry? Again, give that a lot of thought because, again, you could probably save some money. I used to, in my earlier life, do a lot of consulting and product development in one of these big metadata repositories, and people would spend literally millions on a full implementation that in some cases made sense. Some people, they could have just done it with their data modeling tool because really what they were looking at was tables and columns and definitions. <laughs> so give that some thought. Um, so you know, if you've heard me speak before, I'm also a big fan of data models. Um, and they're a big part of data governance, just give some thought of what level. Again, if you're talking to the business, look at, at a conceptual model. It's a great uh, roadmap to that. Um, and then you want to turn those rules into more of a physical data model. Um, I'm sorry. So um, there are other models that are sort of sisters to that. <laughs> A uh, business process model is a great way to really get to the so what. So what, what, what is the business process? What data is used across that business process? And um, that's a great part of governance because, again, if you can catch it during the business process, that really is um, where governance really starts to sing. Kind of the modern, sexier version of a process model. And again, especially if you're engineering, or these are still great. I use them all the time. Don't get me wrong. But when we're talking about things like customer journey, or I've done them for patient journey, I've done student journey, um, it's kind of a customer journey map. And again, when you're talking governance, you cannot forget this. Customer data is used across an entire life cycle as this patient, you know, it's employee. Um, and really getting all of the actors in that of what data is used, what data we care about, um, and who's touching it. This can be a nice interactive way to use design thinking and workshops and whiteboard and sticky notes, um, which is a great way. We did one of these in January with a big marketing company, and it got, it got the steering committee for governance so bought into the process. It's been one of the most more successful governance. Right at the beginning, we had a brainstorming workshop with customer journey maps and sticky notes and kind of fun ways of working, and we overlaid the data. And not only did we have a really clear direction, um, but we got some really great requirements in a very quick way. Very quickly, we had our critical data elements, we had our use cases, and it was one of the more effective ways, kind of using some of these modern methods. Uh, you can mix modern methods with some of the old-fashioned stuff that's still really valuable. One of my favorites is a great tool with a terrible name, the good old CRUD matrix. Um, sounds like something that's in the bottom of your shoe. Um, but CRUD, that's why maybe we call it Druck. I don't know if I can rename it, but there has to be a better name. Um, it shows where data is created, read, updated, and deleted. And something as simple as that, when you're doing master data or you're doing governance, can solve so many problems. Uh, it, the data might be created somewhere, but did you realize that someone updates it downstream or, or is reading it in a certain way? Um, it, again, a lot of these are very simple tools you can do in small pieces that have tons tons of value, um, and, and even just getting an inventory of what systems are touching this or what processes are touching this. Again, you can do a lot of these in small chunks, which leads me to one of my favorite use cases, because we in the data architecture data governance can get kind of a bad rap. This sounds so complicated and so hard. So this was a very fast-paced uh, US-based sales and manufacturing company. They had a, a product they manufactured and sold. So they had the full life cycle from sales to actually delivering and, and shipping the product with customer support, so it was huge. Um, and they had a lot of issues with their customer data. So they had a very high-end product that was expensive, and their customer loyalty was through the roof, but they also had some really embarrassing, you know, you bought one or two of these in your lifetime, and you were in kind of the executive club, and, and you expected to be treated as such. Um, to their credit, they sort of were trying to ship a product and didn't know the person's name, address or phone number. They actually called the well, wasn't phone number, the address. They called the person, and the person was flattered that they called them, but they said, seriously, you don't know my address? I gave it to the sales guy because they didn't have that full lineage. Um, so what we did, because again, fast paced, this was not a company that was going to stop business for months to set up data governance. 
we did interviews. This is one where we talked to the salespeople. We went to the stores and found out how they were gathering the data. Um, and what we did was four-week sprints. Um, we did all of those artifacts, most of those artifacts I showed you. We had a small data model, did a customer journey map, credit matrix, data flow, system market, all of that with a small piece, and we told the story of why that address wasn't right. Awesome results. So those are real quotes. The chief marketing officer, she was a trip. She said, I never thought I'd use the word data flow diagram. It sounds really nerdy, but I love it. No one explained to me why my data was wrong before because we told it in that story with all of those artifacts, which is a small piece. Um, and my favorite one was the head of sales said, ah, oh, shouldn't I have my sales guys, he actually used the word govern, how they're putting the data in? Yes, trying to get a salesperson to do that is hard, but he saw the he, reason, he saw where the data went, he saw why that data was valuable. So you can do all these. So this one, I, the reason I like this story is it sums up everything I talked about in the presentation. We aligned with the corporate culture. We did it fast, we used their words. We found a pain point that everyone could relate to, that the customer address was wrong. Everybody, even the customers felt that one. And we, we did the architecture right, but we did it quickly in small chunks and really saw value. And that was a great way to kick off governance. And they're still doing it, um, but they did it with a quick win. So hopefully that kind of, and it's a real world thing. So hopefully that will pull things together. So um, without further ado, because I saw that there are some questions, uh, just summarizing, hopefully that did summarize it, but you know, the governance is people process tech, all of that. Um, tools are important, but pick the right one for your use case. Um, and no matter what it is, pick some quick wins that also deal with architecture. It's not an either or, and you should see success. Um, as Shannon gathers questions, just remind you, next month we'll be talking about enterprise architecture and my standard sales pitch. If you need help, we do this for a living. <laughs> so Shannon, I'll pass it back to you for questions. Donna, thank you so much. And just to answer the most commonly asked question, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. Uh, so diving in here, Donna, what are your thoughts on data governance around data reservoir and our data lakes? Um, what have you seen that works and are there any good references you would recommend? Um, so yeah, data governance, I think maybe one of the, for a data lake or data reservoir, whatever people want to call it these days, um, I think a good one to reference was this one, of, of reminding just enough data governance. No data governance for a lake is the wrong answer, I'll tell you that, um, but getting just enough and kind of going, uh, I saw one of the comments on kind of key data elements. You know, what needs to be managed? I had a Really embarrassing example, not for me, but for the person who said it. It was a, a junior intern at a big insurance company that had his, they were talking about data quality, and he said, so I shouldn't be putting the credit card data on the lake in the cloud? And his boss talked to him after that, right? It was a, it was a data lake, it should be exploratory, but there's certain PCI you cannot put out. But once that was in place, he should have had the freedom to do whatever he wanted. So just, you know, there's certain things that are non, you know, you cannot mix with. If it's customer private data, you cannot, <laughs> that is still a human being, um, but then don't over govern it either. So that's kind of a high level answer, but kind of keeping this pyramid in mind might kind of help with that data lake versus non-data lake. And Donna, do you find that executive, executive leadership terms or teams are including or excluding the data stewards, pro and cons of that? Um, so ELT, I, I would just terminology tend to say a more executive person would be a either executive sponsor or maybe a data owner kind of at the high level. But if you're talking true executive like CEO, CMO, I would say they're a little too high level. They would be more your executive sponsor. They should be championing it, probably not the person you're going to get down and talk about business rules. I would say yes, they should be involved, absolutely, but I would probably their title might be more of an executive sponsor and probably not the data owner that you're going to be kind of rolling up their sleeves and doing things. And uh, I'm going to try and slip in one more question here, Donna. Do you typically take all rules defined in the business rules and policy documentation and also add it into a metadata catalog? Any tips or recommendations on how to capture those in a major agile implementation style? Uh, I love that idea. I think that was one of these slides here of that policies are fine, you need them, they're important, but really to make them actionable, um, you need to put those rules in your MDM tool or your data catalog or your ETL scripts or all of the above. Um, 
And I think that's where the prioritization with the business case is important and getting those data owners, data stewards involved. So you probably just don't want to take the entire policy to start um, unless that's really easy, uh, but probably just base that around a business use case. So we're talking about patient data. What are the policies we need to worry about to protect to patient privacy? And let's put those in the tool, for example. Because if it's in a policy, it's not being implemented in a you know automated way, which is really what makes it happen. Well, Donna, that does bring us to the top of the hour here. Thank you so much for this great presentation, as always. And thanks to all of our attendees for uh, being so engaged in everything we do and all the great questions. Uh, again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and the recording. Everybody, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, hope you have a great day and stay safe out there. Thanks, Donna. Thank you too. Thanks.